Now I want to get into the message, just a simple message. But it really will speak to you about a, uh, some simple things you can do. What time are we living in? It's a different time than the generation I grew up. And so Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, Watch, therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour. And you know what's, uh, can you put the uh, PowerPoint on the uh, overhead? When I read these words, keep watch, I, I, I knew what it said, but I didn't really know what it meant. In terms of like, what do you do? What do I do as a believer, as a Christian, to watch, to keep watch? You know, you just look around all the time and keeping watch like a nervous person. So I didn't understand. And as I began to research and pray, I realized what it is that we have to watch for and why we have to watch. Because we live in a different time now than the disciples of Jesus. They believed that it was time for Jesus to reign and rule and the millennium was to take place. He would liberate them from the, from the Roman uh, rule and the kingdom of God would physically come to Israel and Jesus and the 12 disciples would reign and rule for a thousand years. And then the great judgment in heaven would go on. Keep watch, for you neither know the day nor the hour, but we can know the season. So Jesus actually tells his disciples, what are the signs of the last days? What are the signs of his coming? He said, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. Now, whenever you see the word fig tree and from the words of Jesus, it refers to Israel. And so when the branches become tender and put out leaves, summer is near. Duh. <laughs> And when you see all these things, what things? You know that the Son of Man is near at the very gates. And I say to you, this generation that sees the fig tree blossom will take place. What are the days are we, we are living in? What is the time we are living in? I believe that the coming of Jesus is very near. In fact, right at the door. And the fig tree blossoming is Israel after two thousand years in 1948 becoming a nation again that's the fig tree and so in 1967 right some of you were alive then most not jerusalem was now in the hands of the jewish people after almost 2,000 years after the destruction of the temple in 70 ADD, ad 30 years after uh, the death and resurrection of christ so we are living in that generation that has seen the fig tree Israel blossom. So the time is closer now than it was in the days of the disciples. We need to discern the time in which we live. In fact, we need to know the hour of God's timing. The disciples, they failed to discern the times. In fact, um, Herod wanted to arrest Jesus. The disciples were discouraged and worried and uh, fearsome. And Jesus said, my hour is not yet. Tell that fox, Herod, that I'll still have to preach. And he went boldly to the temple. When you are in the will of God, you have nothing to fear. <laughs> when you are in the will of God, God has a time for your tree to blossom, for your ministry to bring forth its fruit. God has a time. We want it right now. But you know, a seed has to die. It has to be in the ground where no one sees. It has to allow the Spirit of God to give it life that only God sees. And when the time comes, it starts to blossom. And in its season, it brings forth fruit. Amen. Hallelujah. And so the disciples, after the death and resurrection of Christ, in Acts chapter 1, they're saying, okay, now is the time. <laughs> Is it now the time for the kingdom? And then Jesus starts to rise up before them. They blew it by 2,000 years, right? <laughs> Small mistake, right? And then the angel says, oh, ye men of Galilee, why are you standing looking up into the sky? No, no, Jesus, come back. He said, this same Jesus will return in like manner in the clouds when the hour comes, when the time is right. So meanwhile, Jesus said, keep watch. Now, let's get to this phrase. Keep watch. What does it mean for you this morning in Hungry Generation and you that are watching online 
To keep, keep watching of what? What? Well, Jesus said it. Where? In the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, 40. He came to his disciples. Now, he took three of his closest. Peter, James, and John, right? And he says, watch and pray with me. For my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Remember that Jesus was God, man, God living in a human body that was in, under incredible stress, demonic oppression. And there in the garden, Jesus struggled and he prayed. And then verse 40, he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. <laughs> These guys sleep in the worst times. He says, could you not keep watch with me for one hour? Well, the question still remains, keep watch. What does that mean for the disciples in that garden that night and today for us in this hour in which we live? Well, Jesus actually was reminding them of Passover night. Now, we're not Jewish, right? So we don't have that history except what we read in the Old Testament. But the Jewish people knew very well what Passover night was. A quick resume. So the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt over 400 plus years. Then the night finally came for the deliverance. Because Pharaoh didn't want to let his people go. They cried to God and God called a man called Moses. And he said, I have heard the prayers of my people. You know God hears your prayers? that you're calling out God hears your prayers and the time is coming for the fulfillment of those prayers that you make to God hallelujah and so the people of God are crying out to God God says, I have heard their cries and I'm going to send now go forth and tell Pharaoh to let my people go now listen to this ungodly challenge from a pagan ruler who thought he was God on earth Pharaoh. The Egyptians called the Pharaoh's gods. And he says, who is the Lord that I should let the people of Israel go? And God says, oh, you don't know me? You will know me. <laughs> you'll know my power and you'll know my plagues. Who is the Lord? Let me introduce myself. I am the Lord. I am who I am. <laughs> and in 10 plagues, he punished, he judged, he displayed the power of God. And on the last night, he says, put blood on the door, for my angel of destruction will pass by. In every home that there's no blood on the door, the firstborn son will die. Then he told them to eat a lamb and to have it with bitter herbs and to have their clothes and things packed for that night. God will deliver them. So it was Passover night. And when we read about Passover night, Exodus 12, 42. What a jewel of a verse that I must have read hundreds of times and never understood. But now in the context of what Jesus said in Gethsemane, it makes perfect sense. Let me read it for you. Exodus 12, 42 is God speaking through Moses. That night of Passover was a night of watching. By whom? By the Lord. By the Lord. What was the Lord watching over? He was watching over for the safety of his people. Hallelujah. Do you know that God watches over you as a father cares for his children? Hallelujah. You're not alone. Don't be afraid. Your heavenly father is sending angels to guard you and watch over you. So Passover night was a night of watching by the Lord to bring you out of the land of Egypt. And then as a memory, as a memorial, God now instructs the Jewish people to, so the same night will be, will become, is a night of watching. Now what? To the Lord. I'll explain that in a minute. So it was a night of watching by the Lord. And now to remember that night, Every Passover night, you have to celebrate that dinner and look up to God and let it be a night of watching kept to the Lord by all people throughout their generations. 
So Passover night was a night to keep watch. Can you say a night to keep watch? Passover night was a night to keep watch. What were they, what, 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 what did the Lord watch over that night? Well, as soon as the people said, go, leave, get out of here. They took gold and silver for all of their free labor for those years. And now they're marching to cross the Red Sea. And Pharaoh changes his mind. And that night of deliverance became a night of danger it became a night of darkness it became a night of death it became a night where pharaoh's army is now wanting to bring them back or kill them but not let them go and when they came to the red sea as you know the story there was nowhere to go and so moses starts praying again and god said no 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 it's not time to pray it's a time to watch what i will do as i watch over you And something happened they never saw before. A pillar of cloud began to rise up. This pillar of cloud must have been black smoke. It must have been dark smoke. It must have been this fog of confusion. And this pillar of cloud at night moved between the people of God, almost two million plus people, and the armies of Pharaoh that had chariots, that had horses, that had trained special forces to take them, capture them, and kill them. And this cloud separated, and the Egyptians couldn't see in this darkness. They couldn't see through this dense fog, this black smoke. Here's something very wonderful that God does half of the pillar of smoke became black to the side of the Egyptians and the other side became a pillar of fire that gave light and illumination to the people of God do you know this is a prophetic picture of what is happening in 2020 21 the world in which we are living now is in a black fog of smoke. They're lost. They, don't, they can't see in front of their hand. They're, they're, they have what they think is an ideology, a narrative, and they're, they're not understanding, they're not seeing because there's a black cloud of confusion because the, the generation today is saying, who is the Lord? Who is the Bible that tells us how to live? Who are the Ten Commandments? Who is the patriarchal family? Who is the, the, the nuclear family, a man and a woman and children that love and fear God, the authority God has placed in the family? Who is the Lord, the world is saying. And they see black fog and smoke. And so a Christian living in this time could get really discouraged and say, oh, everything is lost, everything is dark, everything is black, everything is confusion. No, for the Christian, there is a pillar of fire. And more miracles will happen in this time. So to the world, it's a black fog, but God can heal and open the eyes of the blind. Hallelujah. God can put the fire of God where people will see the works and the action of God. Hallelujah. You know, that night in Gethsemane was a dark night. That night in Gethsemane was a black fog of evil rolling in. Because on the road was Judas who betrayed his Lord and his master. On the road to the garden were soldiers sent by the high priest carrying torches in that dark night. But on that night Jesus was praying. And his disciples were sleeping. And he comes to them and he says, could you not watch? Watch for what, Jesus? Watch as danger is approaching. Watch as the enemy wants to tempt you. Oh, by the way, this is what links Exodus 1242 to the Garden of Gethsemane. What night was it when Jesus was praying in the garden? It was Passover night. So they knew that they should not sleep that night. 
They knew that every Passover night was a special night. It was told by God in Exodus chapter 12 that ever since that deliverance, Passover night should be a night of watching. Passover night should be a night of prayer. Passover night should be a night of remembrance to see the fire of God and the waters parting and the deliverance of God from a people chased by those who want to perpetrate evil. Hallelujah. And Jesus returned to his disciples and he said, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. My friends, what hour was it? The hour where God allows darkness for a short time to seemingly overcome the prayers of Jesus, to seemingly overcome the faith of disciples, and now everything looks like it's lost. <laughs> wow, we lose a presidential election. Everybody says everything's lost. <laughs> no, it's not lost. Jesus is on the throne. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus is still king. <laughs> We, we, we may prefer one candidate above another, but that's not our salvation. The Lord Jesus is our salvation. So when, when it says keep watch, there's a reason to keep watch. Because when we fail to keep watch, that's when we fall into temptation. Our failures come. Our failures come. Let me go back to... Uh, Passover, night to keep watch. No one slept that night. The Lord watched over them. And then the Lord said to keep a vigil. Go back to that slide that says a vigil. What is a vigil? A village is guard duty. Do you know, I think we forget when we are in the blessings of God, when we come to a wonderful uh, assembly of, of believers like in Hungry Gen, that we think we're not in a spiritual war. <laughs> we are in a spiritual war. And you, you, you know, it's not a time to rest. It's not a time to just rejoice and be happy and glad that we have each other. It is a time to keep watch for the enemy is approaching. What is a vigil? It's a purposeful surveillance or watching against danger. It was a time to stay awake and watch for the approaching enemy, just like a soldier on guard duty by the way in any army in any war when there's a war going on what is the penalty for falling asleep in time of guard duty it's death it's death so serious was the guard duty well you know our failures come from a lack of watching to the approaching enemy and as a result we fall into temptation you see, we're not only keeping watch for Judas and for those that want to um, uh, attack us or harm us in any way. We're watching for the enemy. And Jesus said clearly to Peter, James, and John, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is. So therefore, watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. Do you know that temptation, if you're not watching, will sneak up on you from where you never expected, you never thought it would come, and you're just cruising along, you're still living on Sunday's blessings and it's Wednesday night, and you're not keeping watch. You're relaxed, you're feeling good, you're happy, which we should, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there is a vigilance, there is a, a purposeful surveillance okay somewhere the enemy is going to come be ready for it be prepared for it be prepared for it do you know the prayer of Jabez he says it ahead of time he says not only expand my borders not only your hand be upon me he says keep me where from the place of temptation keep me from the arena the area of evil in the prayer our father Lord, lead us not into, but deliver us from. That is a prayer. We preach everything except that phrase. We preach forgiveness. We preach God's provision. We preach God's holiness. We preach the fatherhood of God, that he's with us. We shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But we don't pray, Lord, keep me from temptation this day. That's what it means to watch. And Jesus warned his disciples, 
Watch and pray so that you don't enter into temptation. You know when our failures come? When we fail to watch the approaching enemy. The second thing I want to say tonight, this, after, this morning, where am I? How am I? <laughs> The second thing I want to say is don't sleep. Keep watch and don't sleep. There's a danger of sleeping before the coming of the Lord. Ephesians 5.14, Paul says to the most mature church, the Ephesian church. By the way, his disciple who loved him, John, who took the mother of Jesus into his own home. He was the bishop of Ephesus. Ephesus was the most deeply theological book that Paul ever wrote. These were mature, knowledgeable, doctrinally correct Christians. They loved God. Their first love was amazing. Their church was growing. They were deep and profound in the things of the Lord. And Paul writes to them, Awake, sleeper, arise from the dead. Christ will what? Shine on you. Well, that's the pillar of fire, right? Be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but wise, making the most of the time, because the days are what? Good? Are the days in which we are living, they're great days, aren't they? <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> Listen, I was born in this country of the United States. My parents came as immigrants in 1950. My dad became an American citizen and knew, learned the Pledge of Allegiance and not much more English after that. <laughs> He loved America. He fled from Stalin's Russia. He fled from Hitler's Germany. And he came to this country that pledged allegiance to a flag under God. <laughs> we prayed in school until third grade. Did you know that? I went to public school in New Jersey, 18 miles from New York City. And Mrs. Wellsel, our third grade teacher, read Psalm 100. And we prayed the Lord's Prayer every school morning in public school. Until Madeline Murray O'Hare said, her son, David, doesn't want to pray. And you're uh, violating his constitutional rights. And they stopped prayer in our schools. Cold. Madeline Murray O'Hare died a violent death. Her son, David, became a born-again, spirit-filled Christian. That's the justice of God. Now is not a time to sleep spiritually. Oh, to, speaking about time, what time is it? Jesus spoke of the hour of darkness approaching. By the way, how are you using time? Oh, Lord, I don't have time. I need more time. No, everyone gets the same amount of time, 24 hours. How do you use time? By the way, time's more expensive than money because you can lose money and make money, but you can't make up time. You know, your life is, your life is like a high-speed train. You're not going to go backwards on the tracks. The station you left is not the station you will get to. You've left that. Don't leave in the station you left. Go to the next station that God is leading you. When I get more time, I will pray. When I get more time, I will read the Bible. When I get more time, I will go to church. I will be active. But a watchman cannot sleep. His job is to look for danger. And what? Warn the people. God says to Ezekiel chapter 3 and then verse 33, I believe, later on. He says, Ezekiel, son of man, I've, I've, I've made you a watchman over your people. That if you see danger approaching and you are silent, I will require their blood from your hand. Blow the trumpet, Ezekiel. Sound the alarm. Danger is coming. That's what a watchman does. I believe Hungry Jen has been placed as a watchman for your generation. I believe these Zoom, YouTube, TikTok, right? I believe it's God's horn that is used to warn the generation in which you live. Sound the alarm. Blow the trumpet in Zion because the bridegroom is coming. Hallelujah. The king is coming. Let people know that Gethsemane is the hour of darkness, but Sunday morning is the morning of resurrection.
of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the cloud now. We will see the fire on Sunday morning. Our failures come when we are inactive and we sleep instead of praying. Who was a greater hero in the time of Israel than David? The shepherd boy who slew a champion called Goliath, right? And you could read of his exploits. You could read of his special forces. 30 men that could take on a thousand guys in a snowy pit and, and take over a whole, whole field. One man against hundreds. Then he had three that were his top, top, top special forces guys. And you know when David, he got tired of fighting the battles of the Lord. When did David fall? The one time he did not go to battle. <laughs> the one time, the Bible says when the time of spring came, when, the, when kings, kings go to war, David stayed home that day. He deserved it. He did, I mean, if anybody deserved it, he did. But our inactivity leads to other things. And so it says on that day when he rose from his couch, it was like late afternoon. Well, you're sleeping all day. Well, I don't know what he was doing, watching his phone maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, of course, the rest of the story fell into temptation. He, his eyes saw what he loved to see like any person would want to see. When you're not vigilant, when you're not watching, when you're not expecting Temptation comes when you don't expect it. Hello. It doesn't tell you, I'm going to tempt you now. Be ready. Uh -uh. Jesus was hungry in the wilderness. They all said, don't those stones look like the flat bread your mom used to make? Can you just smell that bread? He was hungry. Our failures come when we are inactive and we sleep. Jesus said, don't sleep, but be active for the Lord says work. Matthew 25, verse 1, is uh, an amazing parable that speaks about the days in which you and I are living in now. And he compares the, the coming of the Lord at a time of darkness, like midnight. And then he compares it to the Jewish ceremony of, of, of courting. That is, uh, where a man falls in love with a young girl and he wants to marry her. So they get engaged. They formally get engaged. But they, they go their ways. The girl goes back to her father's house and prepares her dress. And the man, he goes to prepare a place for his bride. Are you following this? This was the Jewish ceremony of the day. Maybe you heard this. I'll just quickly go through it. After a year passes where he prepares her apartment, right? And she prepares for her wedding day. He sends his buddies ahead. And Jesus said they came at midnight. And so a cry was heard. The groom is coming. <laughs> the groom is coming. That's the guy, right? And then, and then the girls, she had her bridesmaids. And, 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 and of course, there's no electricity in those days. So they would use either torches or they would have small clay lamps with a cotton wick. And they would have olive oil and they would light the wick and it would burn for a long time. And they held these little lamps and they would go to meet the groom and the it was just an amazing thing so jesus said at that time the king at wait 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 let me back it up jesus said at that time wait what time our time your time and mine we are living in the time of this parable at that time not in the time of the disciples the time of the coming of jesus that sees the fig tree blossom the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins, ten young ladies. They took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. We'll find out why. And five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps. And by the way, they had oil in their lamps. Their lamps were burning. So you can't fault them for that. That's not why they were foolish. But the wise, however, took the lamps with oil in them and took jars of oil as a backup with their lamps. Now notice verse 5. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. What does it mean that they all fell asleep? 
I don't believe that they stop praying. I don't believe that they stop believing. I don't believe that they, they, they were not aware of what God was doing. I began to think of sleep as, isn't that the time where you're inactive on your bed? Like 24 hours and eight of them are for sleeping or seven or six, whatever you sleep. And basically you are on your back or your side and you close your eyes and you, you choose and you must refresh your body physically. And it's a time where you don't do anything. You're inactive. Now, maybe I've got this wrong, but I don't think so. 2020 was a time of inactivity as far as commerce, gathering, and building was concerned. Would you agree with me? It seems like our economy fell asleep. It seems like the whole world, God says, you're not going to do anything for the next three months. Did you expect that? No. Could you have predicted that? No. You know, a couple of years back, I was in Seattle and the spirit of God came upon me. And I said, you know, the day will come when the church will be closed. And I'm thinking, what am I saying? That's not faith. No, that's God's timing. That's the cloud of darkness rolling in. That's Pharaoh's army who's saying to that generation, who is the Lord? And so we see the Red Sea on one side. We hear the approaching hoofbeats hoof on the other side. We hear the threats of the enemy. We see this dark cloud, this miasma, this fog, this confusion. And we see the miracles of God. Hallelujah. In the minute. We see the coming of the Lord. You see, the book of Daniel tells us many negative things that will happen. But it also says, but those who know their God shall shine like the stars of heaven. And they shall do exploits. And the book of Revelation says, let the holy become more holy. Let the wicked become what? More wicked and more evil. There will be a polarization, a separation of light and darkness. And you're living in that generation and you can't sit on the fence. You can't say a little of that, a little of this. It doesn't work. <laughs> that darkness will overcome you. There are kids in our church that are losing faith. They're, they're not believing the word of God is true and accurate. Every word, every jot and tittle, said Jesus, will not fail, will not pass away. So let's look at them. Let's look at the mistakes, five mistakes that the foolish girls, and that's why they were called foolish. I think they were sincere girls. I think they were spirit filled. I think they had oil in their lamp, right? Their one lamp. Number one, they assumed that that oil would be enough. We need more oil than we think we need. We need more of God's presence than sometimes we ask for, than sometimes we seek for. I, I love what James said and pastor said it today. Draw near to me, says the Lord. I will draw near to you. He is the fountain of oil. Hallelujah. He is the giver of the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit. And he, we need more of him. More to be in the house of God. More to read the Bible. Can I challenge you? Have you read the whole Bible for through from cover to I know, Pastor, there's so many boring, like chronicles. That's like for insomnia. <laughs> Four chapters of who was the father of who. Ah, but come to verse 10, you read about Jabez, who was more honorable. And you'll find these jewels. Yes, they're, they're difficult. And I tried to read them in the Living Bible because it's a little easier. And I just go down through the names. <laughs> Because you don't have to read the father of and he begat. <laughs> Just go da 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 <laughs> Number two, the foolish virgins assumed there wouldn't be any delay. We have the schedule. We know the timetable. This is happening this way. This is happening then. We have our theology. We have our end times understandings. Everything's going to happen the way I say it. No, it won't. God has his timetable, and he will upset ours. Wow. Because he's God, and we are not. But then the people who challenge that, Peter says, no, the Lord's not slow. The Lord is not delaying, as some understand, slowness. He's patient with you. In fact, he doesn't want anyone to perish. 
Think of the worst person you know. Think of the most evil person against God. God loves them. God died for them. And he wants them to have more time to come to repentance. People say, well, if there is a God, why is there violence? Why is there wars? Why doesn't God do something about it? Number one, he did. He died for us. And number two, he's coming to bring justice once and for all. But until then, but until then, his love is so deep that he doesn't want to destroy people. That he doesn't want to judge people. That he doesn't want to separate the sheep from the goats. That he doesn't want to winnow the, the wheat. Then the good wheat goes into his, his storehouse and the chaff is to be burned. God loves people. And so he waits for the perfect time. And if he delays, he delays only because he loves more. He gives people one more opportunity. But he will come. Hallelujah. The hour is dark. The hour is now. We are living in a time not like when I was a boy. Number three mistake. They all assumed that the oil could be purchased in the darkest time. At midnight. No, Jesus said, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. For night is coming where no one can work. What will happen when social media shuts down Christians? What will happen? I don't want that to happen. <laughs> but it could happen, could it not? Uh, is social media being censored, by the way, by big tech? Yes or no? And if it's being censored, who are the censors? It's not godly Christians. It's not God's word. It's not God's plan. It's not God's narrative. It's the thick cloud of darkness. Where they don't even know what they believe themselves. Oh, by the way, you'll hear the word revolution a lot. But I'll tell you something that happens in every revolution, especially in the former Soviet Union. The revolution eats its own. And you will see revolutionaries who started are going to be chewed up by people more revolutionary than them. And they will eat them. Because revolution doesn't care who it burns down, who it criticizes, who it tears down. They mistakenly believe that out of the ashes a phoenix will arise and a utopia will come. Without Christ, never. But the King of Kings is coming. Hallelujah. The bridegroom is coming. He's coming at an hour which you do not expect. And wise virgins, wise men and women of God, they take their lamp and they have lots and lots of oil. Lord, keep it coming. Keep it coming, Lord. Number four, they assume that others could give them oil. It's not. Everyone has to have their own supply. Your lamp cannot burn with the oil from the lamp of somebody else. You have a praying mom? That's wonderful. You have a godly father or grandfather or brother? That's amazing. But their faith cannot save you. When Jesus healed the sick and Jesus forgave the sins, he sent them away. He always said these words, go, your faith has saved you. Hallelujah. It's your faith. You can't get it from other people. And then finally, they assumed they had plenty of time. We're going to go, we're going to pray, we're going to find, we're going to fill, we're going to seek, we're going to buy, we're going to do what we always did. And they missed the banquet. Look at the, the days of Noah. That's what Jesus said it would be like. As in the days of Noah, he built a big ship for everyone who, anyone who wanted to. They didn't believe. Noah, you're crazy. There's no rivers here. There's no lakes here. There's no seas here. You're building this massive boat. Why? Oh, it's going to rain. What's that? <laughs> oh, the floods are... Flood? What are you talking about? We have dew. We don't have floods. And when it started to rain, people are saying, Oh, what he said was true. When the waters began to rise, what he said was true. But God shut the door. Can you picture people treading water in the days of Noah, banging on the ship? We believe now. Noah. Now we get it. Noah, you were right. God was right. God, we repent. But God shut the door. Oh, we need more time. He gave you 100 years. Some say 120. And how many people were saved? Those that believed. 
Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Finally, keep extra oil for the time is now. It's a symbol of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Do you have the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the sign of speaking in tongues, with the manifestations of the Spirit? This is not just a prayer language. This is a ministry language. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have to say this. I heard John Bevere. I was mowing the lawn, and I like to put John Bevere on. He's, he's one of my heroes. And he says, there's four kinds of tongues. I thought, whoa, four kinds. I thought there was two. And, and when he explained that, I said, yep, there are four kinds of tongues. Number one, the tongues of Acts chapter 2, many of them were actual languages of the people who had come from Cappadocia and Turkey and Spain. And as the disciples spoke in tongues, they didn't know what they were saying. They were actually speaking someone else's language. My mom got baptized in the Holy Spirit when she was seven. First time she was ever in an evangelical church, she went with my grandmother. And they were late. They were kneeling in the corridor. And the Holy Spirit came. And my mother, Luba, started speaking in other tongues and singing in the Spirit. Seven years old. And grandma says, what's happening with your child? She's babbling. Well, pastor run over. He said, that's the Holy Spirit. And, and they had New Testaments. And grandfather had a new testament he said yeah it's in Acts chapter 2 as it was in the days of Joel I'll pour out my spirit and you're young you know the verse <laughs> you know the thing <laughs> <laughs> two weeks later my grandma my mother my mother Luba seven years old is by the window and she, she can't stop singing in the spirit she has a beautiful voice my sister Rosita has her voice right she ministered singing from place to place and this seven-year-old girl was singing, and there were men in the garden because my grandfather was an officer in the army, and he was very wealthy, had lots of land before the communists took it away. They liberated them from their land. <laughs> and these men, men ran, ran into grandfather, and they said, I didn't know you were Jewish. He said, no, we're not Jewish. We're, we're Protestants. <laughs> no. He says, your, your daughter, Luba, she's singing in, in Hebrew. What is she singing? She's singing the song of Moses. He says, that's a little girl. She's seven years old. She doesn't know any Hebrew. We heard it in our own language. Come on, tell us that you're Jewish. I'm not Jewish. So that's the first kind of tongues, a sign to the unbeliever that God is speaking through languages they understand, right? The second kind of tongues are a tongues for the church because there are nine ministry gifts that are to be used publicly for the building up and edification like prophecy right or speaking in tongues with interpretation of tongues that's a public ministry gift right that's the second kind of tongues the third kind of tongues and i've experienced this and the last time i was with you I told, is the tongues that come upon you that are tongues of, in, of intercession where you don't know who you're praying for, but you're burdened heavily for someone, and you're praying in tongues, and finally the burden lifts, and God heard what you prayed in tongues, and that person is saved and delivered. Oh, hallelujah. Do you know what? When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, your tongues could be a sign to the unbeliever. Your tongues could be a ministry gift to the church. Your tongues could be a tongue of, in, of intercession for someone. And then the fourth kind is your prayer language. Will you pray as everybody prays in a concert of prayer? You're not praying to the church. You're praying to God. <laughs> that tongues doesn't need interpretation because it's you and the Lord. And that builds you up in the faith. But I'm not going to get into that. I'm just going to say our failure comes when we are satisfied with our present amount of God's spirit. Therefore, seek more oil. I'm going to bring you one last story. In the Old Testament, a widow ran out of oil, and she was going to die. But the prophet came. He said, you know what? Bring your vessels, and not a few. Go and borrow vessels from your neighbor, just empty, empty jars. As many as you bring. The lady's like, why? Just do it. 
So she had how much faith? She brought all the vessels. She had every jar, every container, right? She went to the neighbor, can I borrow some of your jars and vessels? What do you need them for? I don't know. Just give them to me. So as many as she brought, we're not told how many, the prophet began to pour out oil, and every vessel she brought was filled. Now notice this. When there were no more vessels, the oil stopped. Do you know when the work of the Holy Spirit in a church stops? When there's no more open, receptive people. Because we are jars of clay. And this glory is not enough. But we have this glory in jars of clay. And if your heart is hungry, if your heart is empty, the Holy Spirit will fill you and the oil will flow. Hallelujah. So what time is it? The time is now. We are living in God's time. And there's three things I want to remind, remind you of. Keep watch. Our failures come when we're not watching and praying. Number two, don't sleep. Our temptations come when we're inactive. And number three, we are foolish when we are not filled with enough of the Holy Spirit. Because then you live in your own power. Then you live in your own energy. Then you get burnt out. Then you get tired. Then you blame the church. Then you are unhappy. Why? Because you ran out of the presence of the oil of God. Stand with me, would you? Hallelujah, Father, in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would teach us, Lord, what it means to keep watch, to be the guard on duty, to blow the trumpet, Lord, to wait, Father, for danger is approaching, Lord. I pray your Holy Spirit would begin to fill and baptize, Lord, as people seek your face, Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us not to be sleeping or inactive, Lord, but to be faithful to follow hard after you.